Good afternoon. My name is Martins Paparinskis. I'm a reader in public international law here at UCL Laws and a co-convener together with Sylvia Soteo and Paul Mitchell of current legal problems lecture series. I'm also a host of today's talk. The duties of the host are not only important, but relatively narrow and consist of two issues. First, reminder of current legal problems. CLP is UCL's landmark lecture series taking place since time memorial and for the 74th year in this incarnation. We pride ourselves in bringing together exceptional academic speakers and pairing them with exceptional chairs from legal practice. And that brings me neatly to my second duty, introducing the chair of today's talk. We are very pleased to have Sir Daniel Bethlehem as the chair of today's talk. Sir Daniel is a barrister at Queen's Council at 26 Street Chambers and formerly was the principal legal advisor at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the director of Lauterbach Center at Cambridge University and has had a truly illustrious career as a practitioner of public international law. We are very grateful that he accepted our invitation to chair today's talk. So Daniel, the floor is yours. Martins, th thank you very much indeed. And um, let me say how delighted I am to be participating in this UCL Current Legal Problems webinar and to have both the pleasure and the honor to introduce our distinguished le lecturer, Professor Anne Orford from uh, Melbourne University. Um, before I, I do so, before I introduce Anne, um, so that we have a seamless transition, let me just note by way of practicality that after Anne has spoken, we'll have about 20, 25 minutes, um, more or less, uh, available to us for discussion. So if you've got any, any questions or any comments that can be very briefly noted in the Q&A box, um, uh, please do so. Um, I will then be able to pick those up and put those to, uh, to Anne uh, for, for discussion. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to note that also that we've got a very uh, broad and diverse group of participants in this webinar, numbers of, of, of hundreds, and we look forward to a very good discussion. And I should just say, because I know that there's a group of students who've just finished their exams um, down in Melbourne. So for those of you who are burning the midnight oil after your exams, uh, welcome. Uh, with that said, let me turn to our lecturer. Um, you will have all seen Professor Orford's, uh, Anne's uh, bio on the UCL Law Faculty website um, advertising this webinar. And I don't propose to repeat uh, all of the detail there, but just to briefly capture one or two of the headline points in introducing Anne this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you happen to be for this, uh, for this lecture. Uh, she, in fact, uh, requires very little introduction, but let me just um, touch on uh, uh, one or two points. Um, Anne is a very distinguished public international lawyer indeed with a, with a, a worldwide reputation. Uh, she's currently the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor and holder of the Michael D. Kirby Chair of International Law at uh, Melbourne Law School, a law school with a very illustrious tradition in international law. She's also held numerous uh, other positions and visiting positions around the world, most recently at, uh, at Harvard Law School. Anne is a past uh, president of the Australian and New Zealand Society of International Law and is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Science in, in Australia. Her writings on international law range uh, very widely and engage uh, with everything from the philosophy and history of international law um, to the practical application of the law in uh, contemporary circumstances. And I imagine that we will hear something of that in the lecture we are about to, uh, uh, about to hear. She lectures very widely across the breadth of international law with a forthcoming lecture series at the Hague Academy of International Law that in true COVID style will take place in an online fashion um, in January on civil war and the transformation of international law. So against that background, you can see that Anne is um, uniquely qualified to talk to us on, on her chosen topic, regional orders of in and international law, the end of geography or the return to geopolitics. And I am particularly interested to hear what she's got to say. So Anne, with that, over to you. Thank you, Daniel, for that very kind introduction. As will become clear, Daniel's 2014 article on the end of geography 
is one of the jumping off points for this work and I'm delighted he agreed to chair this lecture. Thank you also to Martins Paparinskis and his co-editors at Current Legal Problems for the invitation to give this lecture as part of their annual series and to Kat Balligan at UCL for making the webinar possible. I would like to begin as we begin all public events in Melbourne by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It was of course colonisation that established the ongoing relation between the Kulin Nations and the British nation, and I've often been reminded when I'm on a long flight home to Melbourne from London of the audacity involved in that process of colonising a place 17,000 kilometres distant from the British Isles. And I have that same sense tonight as I present this lecture from the other side of the world to that of my London hosts in the middle of the night here in Melbourne while Londoners are looking forward to lunch. And I mention this issue of distance because the lecture is in part about the kinds of greater spatial orders and regional arrangements of which colonialism formed a part. I'm going to suggest that what I'm calling regional orders have played a significant, although often a background role throughout the history of international law and that they will continue to do so. If anything, regional orders seem set to become an increasingly central feature of international law with the intensification of the rivalry and the rival regionalisms of the US and China. As in past eras, these competing forms of regionalism are expressed and debated through international law. So in this lecture, I'm going to explore the principles and concepts through which international lawyers have sought to justify and make sense of new practices of regional ordering and consider the stakes of those developments for the vast majority of states who have historically been faced with competing demands for their allegiance. So before we go any further, I'd like to say a little about why I'm using the language of regional orders to explore these questions. And this language is like much legally oriented language a little bland. So if I want to talk about the projection of force, the economic ambitions or the territorially expansive projects of great powers, why not use the language of empire or imperialism? Or if I want to talk about the strategic tensions between the US and China, why not use the more fashionable language of geoeconomics, which is currently in vogue in the US and allied policy circles? I'm interested in using the more routine language of regional understandings that we find in the League Covenant, regional arrangements that we find in the UN Charter, or regional agreements that we're familiar with from the fields of human rights and economic law, precisely because that language doesn't carry with it a predetermined critique or sense of the object of study. So often when we pick a term or a concept that's been developed and debated in another field and apply it to the study of international law, we bring a certain amount of baggage to the work of analysis. So imperialism, for example, brings with it a rich history of critique. The term is familiar to all of us. It's been used since the early 20th century to critique both political and economic forms of imperialism. And much important work in international law has made use of, use of imperialism as a critical concept. Yet using that language to study current developments in international law brings with it an assumption about the nature of the object that's being critiqued. And we can see something similar with the language of economic, of geoeconomics. So that term geoeconomics was initially coined by Edward Lutwak, an American military consultant and strategist in a piece he published in the National Interest back in 1990. So that was uh, peak end of history, uh, and like many conservative strategists, he was looking for ways to stay relevant after the end of the Cold War. And he introduced the term geoeconomics as part of an argument that the post-Cold War world of international relations would remain driven by conflict and rivalry between states, but that the preferred means for realising those goals would become commercial rather than military. <clears throat> 
So rather than see the end of the Cold War as leading to a less dangerous period, Lutwak wanted to argue that the threats to the security of the US hadn't disappeared, but they'd changed form. Now his challenge to the liberal inter interdependence paradigm were largely not taken up for the next two decades. But with the arrival of the Trump administration and the rise of China, the language of geoeconomics began to reappear in the US policy world, particularly in the presentation of the emerging trade war and use of corporations as proxies for great power competition between the US and China, and the presentation of this uh, development as something novel, something new in the world. Now, that claim clearly overstates the novelty of the current moment, the idea that competing through trade, commerce and finance as a matter of military and political strategy is something new uh, is obviously a little startling. That's been a commonplace of political strategizing since at least the 18th century. But the idea that there's something novel about the turn to geoeconomics, in fact, works as something other than description. It's a way of arguing that the new rivalry between the US and China requires the adoption of a particular set of geoeconomic strategies and indeed the expertise of geoeconomic strategists. So geoeconomics is one of those terms that I approach with caution because it's been introduced as part of a struggle for influence between different groups of experts and strategists within government circles. Such categories are not designed to help us think, but rather to help entrench the position of one group of strategists and policymakers over another. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's also no need to lift such categories into great debates in the academy. So categories that derive from US strategic policy debates in addition are often the product of a very, very narrow community of experts. So in contrast, in this lecture and more generally, I'm interested in staying close to the language of international law, in this case the language of regional understandings, regional agreements, regional, arra uh, regional arrangements. And that's because international law gives us access to the history of a broader range of struggles over concepts amongst a geographically more expansive set of groups than US or Anglophone policy policymakers. Legal arguments also move between big ideological claims, like this is about geoeconomics, and small technical questions and reform proposals. Lawyers link concrete situations with existing rules, principles, precedents, or exceptions expressed at various levels of abstraction. So focusing on concepts as they're used in international legal argument helps us attend to the relation between theory and practice or between ideology and technique. Paying attention to legal arguments allows us to see what happens when, in the words of Karen Knopp, the rubber hits the road. So most states and other global actors don't have to take a position on what geoeconomics or imperialism means, but they do have to take a position on what collective self-defense allows, the scope of security exceptions to trade agreements, or whether a coastal state that's a party to the UN Law of the Sea Convention can prohibit foreign military vessels from engaging in survey and intelligence gathering activities in its exclusive economic zone. There's a shout out to the students who've just done our exam. So I'm interested in the relation of these debates to how we think about the legal relations between states and other actors and about the spatial principles that underpin current legal transformations. So having said that regionalism is a useful concept for thinking about spatial ordering in international law, I have to admit that regionalism is not a concept that's often treated as theoretically or conceptually rich or indeed foundational by international lawyers. So we spend a lot of time theorizing about legal concepts associated with the state, such as sovereignty or self-determination on the one hand, or the global, such as universal, on the other, but we pay less attention to this issue of the regional and to regionalism as a juridical idea.
Of course, we study the emergence and the significance of regional institutions and regimes in a technical sense, but we spend less time exploring more foundational ideas that might underpin what a region is uh, in, a, in a stronger sense. And to the extent that we think about region, region, regionalism normatively, it's often through a fairly simplistic division of good and evil. So when legal scholars discuss the motivations fueling the regional protection of power by an ideological opponent, they often present it in realist terms as a drive for hegemony or the attempt to create a sphere of influence for malign purposes. So Western commentators might treat Russian displays of regional militarism as imperialistic and vice versa. And in such analyses, regionalism isn't conceptually interesting, it's simply an expression of power. To the extent law enters the picture at all, it's as a constraint on that power, or perhaps something the hegemon will instrumentalize. Alternatively, legal commentators often represent the actions of our own states or their allies in idealistic or apologetic terms. So our forms of regionalism are about the expression of moral internationalism, Regional ordering is a cooperative activity directed to achieving common goods or the projection of force regionally might be a response to humanitarian crises or to guarantee the freedom of navigation. And in that idealistic telling, regional ordering is simply a smooth form of integration and leads to the emergence of only benign forms of hegemony. So even work that explores the relation of international law to issues of territory and spatial ordering often ignores regionalism or pays less attention to it as a concept. And one example is the influential article published in 2014 in the European Journal of International Law by Daniel Bethlehem, who had not long finished his term as principal legal advisor at the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And in that article entitled The End of Geography, Daniel argued that we're now witnessing a moment at which concepts and principles of international law that are rooted in traditional notions of territorial geography are losing their centrality or their capacity to make sense of legal developments. So his argument as I read it was not that geography per se was ceasing to be relevant for international law, despite I gather having uh, cause some fear amongst uh, geographers, but rather that traditional principles of international law premised on the sovereign nation state as the core territorial concept for international law were playing an increasingly small part in the international legal system. And according to Daniel, a state-driven vision of international law still dominated the world of the UN at the General Assembly and the Security Council. And that vision, which he described as the view of international law from New York, was rooted in states, in sovereignty and equality, in notions of domestic jurisdiction and non-intervention, in boundaries, in hard power, in geographic blocks and regional influence. And he contrasted that to the vision of international law from Geneva, which while still rooted in states looks different Big power politics was less frequent, cooperation across boundaries was the modus operandi, and the focus was technical on climate, health, migration, telecommunications, trade, transport, travel, and more. Agencies and organizations, he said, such as the WHO, the WTO, or the UNHCR, are at the sharp end of the world of the future, focused on cyber, on food security, on pandemic health scares, on the interconnectedness of trade and finance. And in fact, the piece is remarkably prescient with a number of pages devoted precisely to this question of global pandemics. So Daniel concluded that while the geography of statehood is, less like, is likely to remain at the root of the international system, it's becoming increasingly less important as people, goods, services and funds flow across borders. So interestingly, Daniel didn't refer to regionalism in that piece, although many of the issues he raised from economic integration through to addressing refugee flows were largely dealt with at the time through regional actions and institutions, including, including in Europe through the EU 
Frontex and NATO. And one of the reasons for this may be that in 2014, one particular vision of regionalism had become so, become so dominant that it, it had begun to be accepted as an expression of universalism. However, the shifting politics of the intervening six years has drawn our attention again to the place of rival regionalisms in international ordering, whether because of the challenge to existing regional orders, for example, through Brexit or the Trump administration's challenges to NAFTA or the TPP, or because of the significance of ambitious new projects, such as China's vision of the Belt and Road Initiative as a regional community of common destiny or its claims in the South China Sea. These developments also make the stakes of choosing between different regionalisms more apparent in a way that may in fact offer opportunities rather than simply threats. So I'm going to argue that thinking about regionalism from a juridical point of view with attention to the variations in the concept historically and comparatively tells a more interesting story. It makes visible the ways in which international law and international lawyers express a shifting geopolitics, but do so in a normative idiom. So I'd now like to talk about um, four moments in which we might explore this, uh, these different regionalisms that have been expressed through international law. One, in the period leading up to the UN Charter, so that's most of history, uh, then in the Cold War period, then in the period of the 90s and the 2000s, in which I think we could say that the US was the sole uh, superpower that was creating a world in the image of, in its own image and that of its allies. And now a moment at which we're seeing uh, a new regionalism being asserted by China. And in each case, I'm interested in exploring how these are justified and characterized through international law. So to begin with, a very quick gallop through the period leading up to the UN. Um, in many ways, what we now call international law is, of course, itself a regional form of international law that imagined itself initially as universal. That's an argument that's been made critically by Anuma Yasuaki and more nostalgically by figures ranging from Carl Schmitt to more recently Ian Hunter. And that idea that in the European law was universal might have just ended up as a curious footnote to history, if not for the fact that European powers came to dominate the world, militarily and economically. And at that point, European international law became equated with, understood as, universal international law. And we often treat that earlier European tradition as organised around the nation state, but as historians like Jennifer Pitts and international lawyers like Tony Angie have argued, for much of its history, European international law was equally a law that governed relations between empires, between great powers, and between empires, states, and those people considered to be outside the family of nations. Spatial orders that extended beyond the boundaries of a single territorial state were often a key element of that legal system. So we might think, for instance, of the establishment of the Congress of Vienna as an example. It was instituted in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars and was an alliance between dynastic monarchs designed to ensure that revolutionary liberal republics could not again emerge to disrupt the European peace. And in that system, the defense of a particular order within Europe became a collective responsibility. A related 19th century development was the articulation of the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 as a core plank of US foreign policy, partly in response to concerns that members of the Congress of Vienna might intervene in the Americas to revive monarchical government. And in his initial articulation of the doctrine, Pe President Monroe declared that as the political system of the Allied powers is essentially different, that is Republican, from that of America, the US would consider any attempt by European powers to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. According to Alejandro Alvarez, the Monroe Doctrine's message that the political system of Europe is different from that of the American states was the gospel of the new continent. 
US commentators insisted that the Monroe Doctrine was a policy of self-defence and not a policy of aggression, yet already by the, the late 19th century, the measures required to defend the US were being interpreted in an expansive manner. And the announcement by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1904 that an international police power was a corollary of the Monroe Doctrine left a generation of Latin American governments skeptical about the implications of the doctrine for the political independence of states in the region. And that concern wasn't significantly displaced by the creation of the League of Nations. Of particular interest to my argument here is that the drafters of the League Covenant were forced to find a place for regional arrangements in the League Covenant due to the significance that the US Senate placed upon preserving the Monroe Doctrine. So the US sought to ensure that joining the League of Nations would not require it to abandon the doctrine or submit the right to interpret it to any other authority. And at the insistence of US drafters, the League Covenant was amended to include Article 21, which provided that nothing in this covenant shall be deemed to affect the validity of international arrangements, such as regional understandings like the Monroe Doctrine, for securing the maintenance of peace. So regional understandings like the Monroe Doctrine was obviously a bit of an open-ended phrase. The meaning of regional understanding wasn't defined, so some commentators interpreted the phrase to mean understandings between states of a region, and others interpreted it to mean an understanding about a region between perhaps widely separated states. And we'll hear that come back uh, when we come to the move uh, from the League Covenant to, in fact, Article 51 of the UN Charter. So the US continued to push for expansive readings of the Monroe Doctrine, including eventually arguing that self-defense extended not only to control over land, but also to control through the sea. And we could think here of the influence of Alfred Thayer Mann, the US naval officer, whose book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, has been described as the naval equivalent of von Clausewitz's On War. And Mann argued that the first and most obvious light in which the sea presents itself from the political and social point of view is that of a great highway. And the Monroe Doctrine couldn't be confined to matters within their own borders, but had to allow the US to police this great highway through sea power. So the League's recognition of regional understandings fueled other claims for extended spatial orders. We might think, for example, of what became known as the British Monroe Doctrine, articulated in the exchange of notes that accompanied the drafting of the Pact of Paris or the kellogg brion Pact of 1928. Britain there articulated its distinct understanding that self-defence rights extended beyond defence against invasion of a state's territory. And the British note stated that there were certain regions of the world in which Britain had a special and vital interest for its peace and safety, and that it reserved to itself the right to act in self-defence against any threat to those interests. And now those regions were not confined to the British Empire itself and extended to regions strategically necessary for trade, communication and navigation, such as the Suez Canal and the Straits of Gibraltar. In addition, a broad range of European lawyers, political thinkers and politicians continued to argue that they were entitled to forms of greater spatial order as well. So not only was colonialism one alternative and the Monroe Doctrine another, but so fascist governments argued that their expansionist policies, whether in the form of the Italian invasion of Abyssinia or expansionist German policies, offered another form of greater spatial order. And here we might think of Carl Schmitt's infinite, infamous translation of geopolitical thinking into international law, where he argued that it was necessary to develop a new concept of spatial order in the form of a greater space or Grossraum extending beyond the state. For Schmitt, the concept of the state uh, was too narrow as a spatial concept for the emerging forms of international law, and he sought to argue that there needed to be a vision of a new spatial order in which nation states coexisted with other kinds of territories, all of which were guaranteed their independence and security by a great power. 
So after World War II, fascist and colonial models of spatial ordering, in which hegemonic powers exercised control over the people and territory of the greater spaces they controlled, were largely discredited. And we generally treat the UN Charter and indeed modern international law as embodying the commitment to states as the primary subjects of international law. So we, we got rid of empires, we got rid of greater spaces, we got rid of regional orders and, the, and states became the subject of international law. And this of course would seem to be borne out by the UN Charter, which includes amongst its opening purposes, the development of friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination. The stress in Article 2 that the organisation is based on the principle of sovereign equality of all its members. The commitment to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And so on. So this model of uh, primacy for sovereign equality combined with the model of collective security embodied in the Charter seemed to render both unilateral resort to force and regional uh, actions a thing of the past. However, the UN also inherited this uneasy accommodation of regionalism that had been introduced into the League Covenant by the US to accommodate the Monroe Doctrine. And the relation between the UN and regional arrangements became a source of bitter debates during the drafting of the Charter. Interestingly, the US and the Soviet delegations pushed to maintain recognition for regional defence arrangements, perhaps unsurprisingly, but so too did the Latin American republics. On the other hand, a number of states, including Egypt, were concerned that regional arrangements might become a means by which powerful states could dominate smaller states, destabilise collective security and break the world up into regional groups. So we often remember one result of that compromise, that is Chapter 8 of the Charter, which provides a very confined place for regionalism in three articles that regulate the relation between the UN and regional arrangements, and specifically Article 53, requiring Security Council authorization of enforcement action taken under regional arrangements or by regional agencies. But the drafters also included Article 51 in order to placate the US and the USSR and to ensure that Article 53 would not make it possible for extra regional powers to veto regional action against external aggressors through dominance in the Security Council. So Article 51 was specifically designed to provide an exception to the requirement for Security Council author authorization of collective enforcement action in cases where states take measures not only in individual but also collective self-defense. So embedded in the UN Charter through the concept of collective self-defence is the concept of greater spaces for which the Monroe Doctrine was taken as precedent. So we could then read the period from the 1950s through to the 1980s as one of struggle over the weight to be given to these competing spatial principles. On the one hand, to the place of sovereign equality, territorial integrity, self-determination and not in the Charter but implied there in Nicaragua non-intervention and on the other to the pressure from great powers for a shift in power from the General Assembly to the Security Council and a persistent attempt to create broad readings of the right to resort to force particularly through Article 51. So with the ending of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union we enter a different phase and I think this is the world of um, Daniel's The End of Geography. And so during this period, the US was increasingly able to shape a new world in its own image for at least two decades. And the transformation of international law was central to that process. The End of History became the useful shorthand for the claim that human society had been progressing in a determinate direction and that liberal de democracy represented its destination. And in that vision, the true destiny of international law was, in the words of Anne-Marie Slaughter, a world of liberal states. <laughs> 
So from the beginning of the early 90s, liberal democracies took advantage of the new geopolitical situation by attempting a systematic process of remaking international law across a wide range of fields. So the 90s was the period during which international law began to, to be uh, realised as a vehicle for entrenching a particular approach to economic policy making through regional, re international and regional economic integration. And this was often realised through the U US led negotiation of ambitious multilateral or regional agreements, which for many trade negotiators were as much a matter of geopolitics as any kind of commercial advantage that might be realised. The second set of developments was the process of creating a raft of new international courts and tribunals and increasing the resort to existing processes of international arbitration. And it was also the period that saw the creation of the networked world order of experts also made famous by Anne-Marie Slaughter. So this is the world in which Daniel's The End of Geography, which, which The End of Geography describes. It's a view of international law from Geneva, accompanied perhaps by a view of international law from The Hague or Stockholm or Hong Kong, that is the world of uh, investor and individual driven adjudication. Yet in addition, the US and its allies also began to argue for new understandings of international law related to the use of force. And so to take one contested example, it was during the 90s that international lawyers began to argue in favor of the evolution of customary international law rules that were said to permit unilateral or regional humanitarian intervention with Kosovo as a key example. A second turning point was the September 11 attack on the US and the resulting initiation of the decades long war on terror. And the US looked to history in support of practice supporting an expansive interpretation of the law relating to self-defense. And that US government position was developed in tandem with the UK and other close allies. And here again, I come to uh, Daniel Bethlehem, who in 2012 published his influential principles relevant to the scope of a state's right of self-defense against an imminent or armed attack by non-state actors. So if the end of geography was written by the Geneva Daniel Bethlehem, these principles were penned by the New York Daniel Bethlehem. Daniel there described himself as having the scholarly intention of stimulating debate on the issues rather than purporting to reflect a settled view of the law. He made clear, however, that unlike other scholarship on the question that showed too little intersection between the academic debate and the operational realities, his principles had been informed by detailed discussions over recent years with foreign ministry, defense ministry, and military legal advisors from a number of states who have operational experience in these matters. And what's now known as the Bethlehem Principles was subsequently endorsed by the legal advisor at the US Department of State, the UK Attorney General, and the Australian Attorney General. So we can think here back to the notion of collective self-defense that's embedded in Article 51, these expansive readings of collective self-defense return us to a more expansive role for regional powers that was embedded in the Charter and that has remained there throughout this period. And, and throughout that period of dominance by the US, the US allies consistently interpreted US power in moral terms. Indeed, arguably, it was that moral interpretation of US power that led to such soul searching in the context of the Iraq war. That began to change with the election of Donald Trump as US president and the very transactional nature of his approach to international law. And that situation created a degree of intellectual and analytical space for assessing the political choices that underpin the regional ordering the US has sought to realize. So we might compare that with the Chinese approach to regional ordering. China is challenging the US-led order, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, through institutional entrepreneurialism, through providing infrastructure for development, and through challenging US military power and credibility with calibrated pressure in the South China and East China Seas. In turn, Chinese legal scholars have also articulated a vision of regionalism that underpin underpins these moves. Like the US, the Chinese leadership and Chinese scholars present this regional exercise of power in legal and normative terms. 
and international law has been one field through which scholars have sought to interpret the meaning of these changes for China and for the world. So in this account, Chinese legal scholars focus on the emergence of China from a century of humiliation, the historical role subsequently played by the new China as a force for resisting imperialist war and promoting new principles of international law, and argue that in the aftermath of the Korean War, China and India formally committed to the five principles of peaceful coexistence, incorporated these principles in the closing declaration of the Bandung Conference, and uh, China has maintained opposition to acts of aggression during the Korean War, the Vietnam War, interventions in Latin America, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the, Chinese, and the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. So Chinese lawyers stress that China's approach to international law differs from that of other major powers, particularly the US, in its resistance to interfering in the systems of other states and its preference for peaceful resolution of international disputes, though not international adjudication. And the second way of telling the story would be to focus on economics. Here, the rise in power and influence of China's reformist economists uh, saw China's accession to the WTO in November 2001 after 15 years of negotiations and China's now transformation into a major economic power. Under Xi Jinping's leadership, China has begun a more ambitious phase of engagement with international law. And for Chinese scholars and those engaged with their work, the economic rise of China offers a different model to that offered by Western states, a Beijing consensus to compete with the widely uh, criticized neoliberal Washington consensus of the 1990s. So the Belt and Road Initiative is also presented as part of a historical narrative foregrounding China's unique role. It's been normatively framed by Chinese international lawyers as a contribution to creating a regional community of common destiny. Just as the Silk Road represented friendship, peace and commerce, the Belt and Road Initiative embodies the idea of cooperative international law. Despite the appeals to a history of resisting imperialism and aggression, Chinese legal scholars are also beginning to articulate a new and more ambitious role for China in the region. And in that context, a number of influential Chinese legal and philosophical scholars, including Jiang Shigong, Wang Hui, and Louis Jianfeng, have begun to draw on the work of Carl Schmitt to shape possible interpretations of Chinese, China's role in resisting imperialism through constituting new forms of spatial order. According to Liu, in Schmitt's terms, as China continues to grow, the US has every reason to be worried. The relationship between the US mainland and the newly emerging space of East Asia precisely resembles how old Europe was squeezed out of the Western Hemisphere by the world historic rise of America. Just so will America be squeezed out of Asia due to the world historic rise of China. Currently, this is happening with respect to China's challenges of US delineated free space. So that's a quote from Liu, and we can hear here, of course, China's assertions of historic rights uh, in the South China Sea. In that sense, I think it's useful to understand the Chinese reaction to the South China Sea arbitration alongside the US reaction to the IC ICJ's decision in the Nicaragua case of 1986. In both cases, the US and China contested jurisdiction. Both were affronted at the suggestion that they should be asked to submit questions of regional security to international adjudication rather than negotiate a solution. And both sought to argue for a form of customary or historic right that persisted alongside multilateral constitutive treaties. I must admit, I don't find the concept of historic rights of continental states possessing outlying archipelagos existing alongside the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea any more or less plausible than the concept of a historic right to humanitarian intervention existing alongside the UN Charter. The difference, I think, in our response is in part because we have a moral understanding of international power and the purposes for its exercise when that power is exercised by the regional hegemons with which we are allied. The different ways in which the international law com community approaches the question of American and Chinese influence highlights the rela relation of politics and ideology to international law. 
So is it possible to be realistic about that without becoming cynical? So this is where I would like to end. So far I've suggested that there are plural versions of regional orders currently being proposed and that a narrow, narrow dualism between good regionalism and bad regionalism, or indeed between good universal, universalism and bad regionalism, is not possible. So where does that leave us? I don't want to suggest that it leaves us in an anything goes situation. Instead, it leaves us reminded of the necessity to choose, to make a commitment to particular forms of regional understanding or regional arrangements that reflect particular values, to experience the responsibility for that choice and to assess as clearly as possible the implications of committing to one form of regionalism rather than another and to realise that this is an ongoing process. Every vision of regionalism to gain real power must find expression in legal terms. So as a result, each time that state officials or international lawyers champion a new reading of collective self-defence or argue for the legal implications of particular freedom of navigation exercises, or choose to join a particular treaty or organisation or infrastructure bank or alliance, they are participating in the reconstruction and the realisation of different visions for coming regional orders. Whether regional ordering is a good thing or a bad thing cannot simply be answered in the abstract, but requires evaluation of the values and the interests that regional powers seek to promote and the model of community they aim to bring into being. And thinking about the battles over the future of the European Union often is, offers a good example of this. In many ways, what was at stake, both in the referendum over Brexit and in the ongoing struggles over responses to the pandemic and the legacies of austerity politics, is who or what Europe represents. Do we understand the European Union as a market building project or a social rights project? Was the creation of the European Union and the establishment of the four freedoms a project of cosmopolitanism or a vehicle for replacing one form of law with another through the movements of the European individual? Does a commitment to the stability of the euro mean jettisoning social democratic traditions and economic mechanisms? So thinking about the region as a juridical concept might help to bring some of those questions into view, make visible the forms of legal ordering that have long been with us and open up a range of possibilities beyond simply being for or against the state in international law. And as Detlef Vax commented, doing so might force people who do find the idea of great power hegemony attractive to confront its implications in a concrete way. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I had a sense that there was um, a kind of a hinterland of legal philosophy and deep thinking uh, to some of the issues that maybe I've touched upon uh, from uh, the perspective of a grubby practitioner, but I hadn't realized that it was quite so elegant. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got a number of questions, and I should just say to those who've been typing things in that it's not quite so easy to read um, lots of type uh, on, a, on a screen a little way away. I'm going to try and do so in just a moment, but I'm going to... Uh, um, abuse my prerogative of, uh, of, of chair and, and just try to put uh, a kind of a general question to you to start off with, um, uh, because it may open up uh, some other uh, sort of lines of inquiry. And the general question um, is, um, well, it comes in a number of parts, but it's, it's really the following. I, I'd be interested to know whether you um, are describing um, the world, uh, obviously through your own vision of it, but, the, the, but the, the world as it is, how we got here, or whether you are projecting where we are going. Um, and the, the sort of the explanation to that is that I'd also be interested to have a sense of whether you think we've got a choice in where we're going, or whether we are, you know, the choice uh, through the power of ideas, the kinds of things that we're talking about now, or whether we are, you know, in a vortex, um, a rise of China, um, a, 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 a stepping back of the United States, which is going to lead inexorably 
to a place which we may be able to control on the fringes, on the margins, but not ultimately through the power of our, our ideas. And in that context, um, your focus on regionalism, um, um, I mean, is that in fact seeding um, the ground to what I've always understood to be an a central idea, a, an essential idea of international law, which is of multilateralism and universalism, because you've spoken about, you know, 51 is, Article 51 is a move away from uh, the, the, the primacy of the Security Council. Um, if you look at the GATT and trade, Article 24 and customs unions and free trade areas are a move away from multilateralism. So um, I, I'm lumping all of these things together because I'd like to get a sense of whether you're taking a snapshot and saying this is the world as it is, or whether you're saying this is the world we're inevitably going to come to in, in terms of your thesis. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so in part, I would say that one of the things that frustrates me a bit is um, the kind of rehearsal of the idea that it's uh, we really need to come back to respecting sovereign equality or um, it's really terrible that we haven't properly respected sovereign equality. And it seems to me that great powers and regional ordering has been built into the system of international law as long as there has been such a system. So if, if we want to imagine something else, it will be necessarily something new. So I'm actually not being, I think, pessimistic about what's coming, but, but I'm trying to be realistic about where we've come from. So that's one of the reasons that I'm putting some weight on Article 51, um, because um, you know, Australia and many other countries are doing a lot of work with Article 51. There's, of course, been a pushback against that in part now from Brazil, Mexico and other countries who are trying to actually um, react to that at the Security Council or push for greater discussion of how Article 51 is being read. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to call attention to the ways in which through, you know, what is sometimes um, a development in a particular moment that it's part of a longer history in which a certain vision of regional orders is being shored up. Um, in terms of, I guess it's also coming from a country like Australia that's, that's a middle power, so I suppose there's also a sense of realism there that... Um, to a certain extent, we're not always choosing. We are having choices made for us and trying to do the best we can with them. And Australia, as you may know, is at the pointy end as we speak of the US-China rivalry. Um, China's just told us, if you make China an enemy, China will be an enemy. Uh, and um, given the Australian government a list of 14 ways in which Australia has been uh, misbehaving largely through um, aligning itself very strongly with US, for instance, freedom of, freedom of navigation, the um, critique of um, the South China Sea position and um, Australia calling out uh, the need for investigation into COVID at the UN. So there's a number of ways in which uh, um, there's been a kind of intensification of a need to choose to make a choice. And I think Australia in some ways is uh, an example here. Um, as to whether there's something more positive that could be coming, so you know, the the really dystopian vision, I guess, is that they'll just there will end up being one power that will control everyone and decide what we're all going to do. Um, another vision would be that we'll kind of have a very strong commitment to sovereign equality and we will move away from this regional ordering. It seems less likely to me. Um, or that we'll have a kind of balance, more of a balance of power situation in which there will be uh, a return to kind of regional alliances. And if that were to be the outcome, I think ideally one would hope for a transformation of what regional orders have been. And here I think the European Union is extremely interesting to watch whether it's possible to create something that is more truly, that has a more truly social and democratic constitution, uh, if what we really need to do is move beyond the state as our dominant political form.
Thanks, Anne. Um, I, I might pick up on some of those things a little bit later on, but let me move to some of the questions. And there are some that are sort of quite specific about counterterrorism and some that are more general. So let me try and start off with some of the general questions. And um, sort of apologies to all those who are out there. Uh, some of your names come up clearly, some of them don't. So I'm just going to focus on the questions rather than giving a shout out to the, 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 you know, the named individual. Um, so here we've got a question um, which asks, did I understand correctly that you make a claim to neutrality with the term regionalism? And um, the questioner goes on to say, or, be, or, or frames this by saying, I understand and sympathize with your decision to exclude loaded terminology that often shows belonging to a tribe rather than nurture discussion and de deliberation. However, I doubt that terminology could ever be neutral. Um, and she goes on to ask, did I understand correctly that you make a claim to neutrality with the term regionalism? Uh, yes, I don't make a claim to neutrality. Uh, and of course, any term that I'm using uh, requires me to take responsibility for its history and for what comes with it. So that's why I'm trying to explain or defend or justify my decision to work with legal concepts. The alternative is to bring a concept across from um, another field or another debate and then spend some time trying to explain why what I'm trying to talk about is the same as this other thing or what version of this other debated concept or contested concept from another debate is relevant to what I'm trying to show you. Um, the reason I stay closer to legal idioms often in my work is to avoid that middle ground, that middle step where I have to try and bring into relation some well-developed theoretical architecture from somewhere else and the thing I'm trying to talk about. I feel that what I'm trying to talk about here is sufficiently difficult to grasp without then trying to measure whether it matches up. So is this or isn't this the same thing as 19th century imperialism? And if so, which version of it am I trying to talk about? And in the end, it kind of becomes less helpful because we have to really spend a lot of time there. I'm, you know, happy amongst friends to <laughs> call some of what I'm talking about imperialism if we all kind of knew what we meant, but um, I'm not sure it really helps other than to say, well, this is bad. And I would rather say, this is bad by showing you what's happening and helping to make very clear um, what the implications of that are. Um, the other point would be that some of these big ideas, this is about imperialism or, or this is about democracy or this is about liberalism, um, the, the move between these big general categories and then very technical shifts in legal relations or legal arrangements the move between those two things is part of the work that lawyers do. It's part of the work of making an argument. This is a good thing. This is a good reform because it will lead to justice. And this is a bad reform because it will lead to imperialism. So in a sense, that is also a kind of polemical work. And I'm not so much doing that here. But I mean, not neutrality. I mean, it's it, it, motivated. It's, I mean it's, it's interesting because I suppose that there may be some uh, and I, I'm not suggesting uh, here whether this is a good thing or, or a bad thing, but there may be some who would argue that um, um, regionalism you know, is a kind of form of subsidiarity and it's a kind of democratization. It's a return to grassroots. Um, but of course, it's also used as a way, for example, um, of getting around the problems of the veto in the Security Council. I mean, we saw that with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we saw that perhaps... Um, uh, you know, with the emphasis on regionalism when it came to the Libyan intervention, um, uh, Arab Spring initiatives, and 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 so on. Um, so it's you know, I, I wonder whether there isn't a sort of a tension with um, the view that seeks to root developments in international law and perhaps more operational international law, this kind of the day-to-day -day transactions of states, more in what um, those in the region actually want uh, and are actually prepared to do. It, it's a kind of a legitimizing thing um, from those who are looking at the big picture of international law and are looking at international law as the great sort of equalizer and are moving away from the hegemony of states internally, 
and the kind of hirsch lauterbach view that international law was the counterweight to the abuse um, domestically. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm wondering as you speak, whether you um, are, are paying um, regard to the inherent tension that there is in regionalism. It may move us in good directions and bad directions. It's invoked by despots, but it's also invoked by liberal interventionists. So um, it's a, there seems to be a tension in what you say. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I would say that trying to attend to the values and the interests that are being articulated in any attempt to um, refer to regionalism is part exactly part of what I'm trying to do. Um, so partly I was also reacting to a piece that Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote called A Regional, Regional Responsibility to Protect, where she was arguing uh, and I mean, we see a lot of arguments along these lines that Kosovo, for instance, should should be a model for how we think about uh, the future of international law. And there she was arguing that, you know, there should be a kind of right for regional organisations to intervene without Security Council authorization. Uh, but there should be a kind of amendment of Article 53. Um, but there was also kind of an alignment there with um, with NATO's actions and so one of one of the reasons I became interested in this was thinking about the fact that NATO of course isn't a regional organization it precisely isn't set up as that it's set up as an article 51 self-defense organization and I wanted to argue that that really matters and it's really to kind of insist that we shouldn't think of NATO as, as regional in this way that you're suggesting where somehow regionalism brings with it a sense of kind of bringing things back to the community, to a regional community. There's this other tradition of regionalism, which we could think of with the Monroe Doctrine, where it's precisely not about a community or not necessarily about a community kind of supporting each other, a solidarity move, but rather about a regional hegemon controlling a region. And there, do you know, to have NATO... Um, it's, so in Libya, we, we, we had... Um, the Arab states organising, but we but we then had NATO intervening, and to 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 kind of describe that as the intervention by a regional organisation seems to me much more of a Monroe Doctrine idea because the regional organisation doesn't include Libya. It it is the regional organisation that is committed to the security of the North Atlantic, not the Middle East and North Africa, and I think it's very dangerous to start making arguments about NATO having this broader um, out of area mandate. So that's kind of one of the places that the work started. Thanks. I'm sure we could follow each one of these uh, these points, but there are, there are a couple of questions which I'm going to take together because I think they go in a sort of the same direction. Um, so one of the uh, one of the questions uh, is complementing your analysis on the contemporary uh, moment in the role of China. Um, and um, would like to ask you what you think exactly of the viewpoint of China on world affairs would be, um, thinking about uh, US, EU, what that was in, you know, a neoliberalist view, what's the view of China um, as you looking forward? And an associated question, not so much focused on China, but um, how should we think about the place in today's world of regional orderings pioneered by non-hegemonic powers, such as the Association of South e Southeast Asian Nations. Um, and I, I think both of these questions are coming back to the point that I began with, which is you know, pushing you to, to project into the future how, in what direction you think, think things are gonna go. What is China's evolving view likely to be? And where do you see you know, ASEAN, or you know some of the the, the Latin American um, sort of groupings uh, influencing this development. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood the first question. I'm also very aware that there are a number of um, students and colleagues from China listed to be here. So I would be. Uh, I'm, I'm not somebody who could speak to the Chinese viewpoint. Um, and, and would feel loath to do so. I have been trying to read in English um, a lot of work by Chinese international lawyers and legal philosophers, which I'm finding extremely interesting and very, very different to the kind of way that uh, China is narrated 
in the West. I'll, I'll, just, I... I'll just interject to say that this question, and I will name her Emily Jones, um, uh -huh. is, uh, is a lecturer at the University of Essex. Uh, okay. She may have a particular vision about, about China, particular expertise, but that's not where, uh, not, not a self-evident self from the questioner. Yes. Hi, Emily. Um, so, um, perhaps, so to try and kind of perhaps come at this differently, the rise of China seems in the story I've been telling of world historical significance. If we think about a version of international law that is European, that it successfully projects itself as international and universal, uh, in which now one of the two great powers is China. Um, so, so in many ways, China sees itself as a power of kind of world historical significance that's extremely clear in the narratives that, are, that I'm reading in English. And if we think about the history of this form of international law that comes out of Europe. Indeed, to have China playing this role now is quite remarkable. So one of the things I think that's happening is that many lawyers from particularly the ang Anglosphere, which I guess I know the best, aren't really coming to terms with the inevitability and the kind of enormously important systemic shift that that will mean to everything that um, international lawyers have understood the system to be about. I don't mean that I think um, China is hell-bent on re kind of blowing it up. I think, in fact, China has seemed far more committed to international law as it currently exists than the US has, at least, that is, for the past four years. So it's not, not that I mean um, that China has something radical in mind. And nor, at least until now, has I think China is in good faith to say that it hasn't been an aggressive um, state and that it's been committed to non-intervention. Uh, on the other hand, it is very protective of its own sovereignty and of the question of um, <clears throat> its own territorial integrity. So I think those two things go together and to be fair, it's also protective of other states' territorial integrity. Um, the real, we often hear talk about a difference in values between China and states in the West, and I think the key value remains democracy. Uh, and for me, that's a pretty big one. <laughs> it would be, it's hard for me to imagine a strong, um, how a very strong alliance without democracy will be possible. But um, I think that many states are going to have to be thinking about that. Um, the question about what, what to make of other regional groupings is fascinating. And, and I did a little bit of work preparing for this on the non-aligned movement. And I think we all have a lot to learn from the <laughs> non-aligned movement as we seek perhaps to hope that we could be non-aligned or that at least great powers would not force us to choose between them. So I think uh, we might find that there is some more uh, to be learnt from what uh, finding ways to be in alliances or to be um, non-aligned that leave more autonomy than states have had traditionally. Thanks, Anne. There's, I think one last kind of group of questions that I'm, I'm going to put to you. Um, some coming from uh, the, uh, the 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 audience, um, uh, and uh, I'm going to add an aspect from me as well. Um, the initial questioner who asked about um, uh, about um, whether regionalism was was sufficiently neutral um, also asked um, on whether you could expand on how you use regionalism in um, in the counterterrorism context and why you find it useful in that context. And I'd, I'd like to sort of broaden that out by coming back to, I mean, you've been kind enough to, um, you know, sort of frame your remarks by reference to sort of end of geography. You didn't need to do so because, in fact, that was just a touch point. But as you've done so, I, I, I'd like to just broaden it out with, this, with the following. 
which I think also sort of hinges on the counterterrorism sort of question. And that is that uh, when I was writing that, I have to say I didn't see it perhaps in, you know, the kind of terms, historical terms that you were seeing at 1990, the 2000s. Um, I was seeing it rather in terms of, I suppose, two questions. Um, the first one was how to um, to address transboundary challenges, because there are evident transboundary challenges, and we're living in a moment, a quintessential moment of transboundary challenges. Now, maybe that the response is becoming inward looking, you know, travel bans and all the rest of it, but it, this is a quintessential transboundary challenge. And the second one was a sort of sense that international law, in terms of those it was addressing, has been changing over time. Once you had treaties that addressed um, the way states should act, now we've got treaties that address the way uh, internet service providers um, should be providing their services, and states then have to legislate. And in, you know, in the context of the transboundary challenges, um, I'm sure there are many different ways of doing this, but I had identified a sort of a number, you know, the international environment, shared spaces, the atmosphere, the global com commons as one, um, uh, uh, the movement of people forcibly displaced and vol voluntarily migrant. Um, third, the challenges to human, animal, plant life and health, and we're in a moment of a pandemic. Um, the fourth, the, uh, the increasing growth in global trade and financial flows. Fifth, the increase in the global use of the electromagnetic sphere, electromagnetic sphere, and then six, the transboundary challenges to security. And this brings us back to the question about sort of counterterrorism. Um, so I'm going to sort of broaden that and say, um, what do you perceive to be the the challenges to what we have regarded as a settled international uh, legal order? Um, and how do we go about addressing them if they are transboundary? Can we address them in a regional uh, manner? Or do we have to actually reconceive international law away from, from statism, if you like, away from regionalism, um, even away from multilateralism with its focus on states, and more to, to something that is much more inclusive with different subjects, a different way of legislating, different different conceptions of jurisdiction and so on. It's a big question on which to end, but um, uh, that's the invitation. Thank you. So um, I think a lot of the ways that we've thought about this have assumed the US as the continuing superpower, perhaps the sole superpower. Um, so ideas about counterterrorism or ideas about transnational law um, in many, many ways still circle around the US, I think, or the US and Europe. Um, and I was, and I'm really struck when I hear people talking about transnational law, how much that often comes down to, you know, cases or um, attempts at extraterritorial jurisdiction that are really um, kind of, coming from the US. If we imagined China taking the same kind of actions, you know, everyone would be enormously concerned. And I, you know, I, and I have been reading people describing how worrying it is that um, the Belt and Road Initiative may involve uh, adjudication being brought within the Chinese legal system. Something that, you know, has been part of what it is to have the US as a hegemon for a long time. And I, f and I have the same response to the counterterrorism point. The reason I'm trying to insist on the fact that the response to that is regional under Article 51 is to try and bring back to attention how much that's been dependent upon the idea that there's a kind of benign hegemon that we're comfortable, well, perhaps not all of us, with um, conducting these counterterrorism operations anywhere in the world. And again, if, say, Russia began to adopt that position, I think Western international lawyers 
would be worried. So there's been a, a, a limited form of reciprocity. There's been a kind of asymmetry with only one hegemonic power, which means that a particular approach doesn't have any pushback. It, it can just kind of continue exponentially. And I can't see that as being sustainable. Um, so I think that many of the issues you've addressed are absolutely the key issues. But I don't think the way that we've thought about coming at them will will be what happens. And that's partly because, you know, um, China deciding that it's going to get to net zero emissions by 2050 will has changed kind of everything in climate change in a way that um, that is quite striking. So, you know, I think so much is going to be shaped over the coming decades by the decisions made by China that any um, assumptions about how international law is going to work that take what's happened to date as a starting point, I think are going to be off. And so I think it's really important that we all try and understand what's coming to a degree. It, it sounds as if this is, in fact, a, 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 a proposal to, to, to Martins and the, the UCL team to have a continuing series on precisely, this, on precisely these issues, because you've sketched the horizon um, and we've got to work out the steps that we need to take to get there. But um, I'm going to, <clears throat> with regret, because there's lots more that we could talk about, but I'm going to draw this to, to a close. We've been going um, now for close on, on, on uh, um, uh, an hour and, and 20 minutes. Um, uh, before I do so, I'm going to just give a wave to Ricardo Arredondo in Buenos Aires, who uh, asked, uh, who, who, who sent well wishes, but rather than asking, asking a question. Um, and I'm going to say thank you to all of those numbers of hundreds who are out there um, in the ether all around the world for, for joining us. But um, my thanks uh, sort of initially to, uh, to, to UCL, to Martins, to, to Kat behind the scenes, who's been uh, making this all, uh, all, all function smoothly. My thanks to, to them for organizing and hosting, but, and my real thanks are, are, are to you for a, a wonderfully stimulating and thought-provoking and challenging uh, lecture. Um, we all try and um, take a snapshot from the window of the train um, of, the, of the, uh, the scenery as we go past. And sometimes we're going past slowly enough to do so and sometimes uh, not, not slowly enough to do so. But you've given us a lot of uh, a food for thought and I thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll be returning to these topics again. We look forward to seeing this in print in due course. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks.